Time is very far spent. So by God's grace, we're going to go into the word of God. Is that all right? Can I beseech you just to stretch forth your hands so you can say seed and you're going to pray for me. Amen? Because whatever PS had is, is trying to find some sort of location in my body, but I'll bind it in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. But just pray that God gives me grace of utterance to speak a word and just pray that the Lord will speak to me through you. Let your expectation rise before the throne of God. Oh Elohim, I need grace. I need your wisdom. I give you my tongue. I give you my heart. Lord, I pray even now, let this word, Lord God, be rich, oh God. Let this word be satisfying. Let this word be a word that prunes and, and exhorts and encourages and edifies. Let this be a word, Father, that enables us to be more like you. We need you, King Jesus. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Y'all can just look at the person next to you and tell them you're looking handsome, looking beautiful looking sweet looking lovely also so as you guys know we've been in a series called transition amen um, and we've been talking about um, God taking us into a new thing me and my creative self try to find how can we fit transition into the gospel. Amen. And I want us to go to the book of Genesis 22 this morning. Uh, we're going to look at a man called Abraham. We're going to look at a man called Abraham who God graced to become an example of what he would do 2,000 years later on the cross. And I I just want to emphasize transition. What were the three T's? I don't remember. Yeah? Mm? <laughs> yeah, I can't, yeah, sure. <laughs> Start again. Training. Testing. And transfer. Training, testing, and transfer. So these three T's, let's go to the recap for me, man of God. These three T's are um, keys that God gave us in how we are going to transition in this season. This transition for all of us may look differently in regards to the outcome, but there are three things that God is doing in this season. He's training you. And I used a, a new word challenge as an example. This looks like doing the challenge. Testing looks like application. And transfer looks like reward. I want you to remember this because Abraham, too, went through training, testing, and transfer. And it's all going to make sense in a second. Let's go to Genesis 22, from verse 1 to 14. I just want you guys to have in the backdrop of your mind. Training, testing, and transfer. The Bible reads, Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham, and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here am I. Then he said, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place of Pharaoh. And Abraham said to his young men, stay there with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship. 
and we will come back to you. What manner of confidence, shall? Verse 6 says, So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and the knife, and the two men went together. Verse 7, But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Verse 8. And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So two of them went together. Verse 9. Then they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Verse 10. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Verse 11. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. Verse 12. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Verse 13. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked. And there behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide, a.k.a. Jehovah Jireh. And it is said to this very day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Amen. Very popular scripture. Amen. Very popular story. Um, if we go to verse 1, I, I just want to run through it a bit, line by line, and I'm going to land on my point. Is that okay, people of God? So, in the context of this being transition, just to give you a bit of backstory, um, Abraham and his wife Sarah were barren for about 75 years, if I remember correctly. Um, Abraham then took matters into his own hand and went to go and sleep with one of his um, house girls. So, uh, yeah, house girls, so I can call that that's name. <laughs> and they gave birth to a son called Ishmael. Um, and then um, 25 years later, God visited Abraham again, and then they gave birth to the promise through his wife Sarah, and that promise was Isaac. I'm echoing that because... When God comes to test Abraham, God says that Abraham should take his son, and God says, only son. This already tells us that what may look natural to us where Abraham had two, God recognized only one. So in heaven, when it comes to God testing you, He's testing you according to the word he gave you. God didn't instruct Abraham to sleep with his house girl. God gave Abraham a promise that his son will come through his wife. He was barren, Isaac. So, furthermore, he adds to the only son, the son in whom you love. This is the first time, beloved, we see the word love in the Bible. And for some weird reason, it's connected to sacrifice. Jesus taught us in the Gospels, no greater love than this, but for a man to lay down his life for his friends. Jesus says that we pass from death to life when we choose to love one another. So, he calls this a test because he wants to find out 
is Abraham going to obey? But if I break down the three T's in this scripture, the training here is the ability to hear God. Abraham's been trained 25 years, 30 years, 40 years. Abraham lived his life only by the voice of God. And here we see variously, God says, offer your son on a mountain, which I will tell you. So Abraham doesn't even know where yet. Very key point. Because Abraham has to stay in consistency of hearing God. We'll get there in a minute. The consistency of him hearing God is that, next, go to the next slide, please. Abraham is about to do what God said, past tense, which is kill Isaac. Yeah? That's the test now. If Abraham was not in, let me say the word, vigorous training, he could have failed the test because he did not learn how to continually hear God's voice. So it, it's possible to, sound, to be doing what God said out of time, therefore not be in the will of God. Are you guys following me here today? Because I spoke earlier about time. And God is very particular about time. When Jesus came to die on the cross, God said it was at the right time. At the fullness of time. The appointed time. So there are things that happen in time. Obedience is present, not past. Time. The test here is will Abraham continually obey God's voice? This here, this story is a transition story because the chapter after, if you do know the Bible, his wife dies. And then afterwards, you've got to find a wife for Isaac. But the beauty of the transition here is this. What Abraham didn't get to do, God was giving him a picture of what he would do for Jesus Christ. His son Isaac, God bless him, grown man, you know, he's about 30 here. Huh? He's like, yo, there's fire, there's wood. I'm confused, dad. Where is the sacrifice? And Abraham's only response is that the Lord will provide. You see, this thing called transition is supposed to look like it doesn't make sense, guys. It's not really a transition if you have all the tools and the answers now for what's next. Are you guys following me today? It's not really faith if you know it, all the conditions and all the answers. It's not really, is it, guys? Abraham told his two servants that we're going to go yonder and worship, and then we will come back to you. So Abraham has this confidence built in training where his faith has so much developed that Hebrews 11 says that Abraham reckoned that God was able to raise Isaac from the dead. So Abraham didn't see God's instructions at the end. Some of us, that's how we behave. We act like what God has called us to do, consecration. This is the end of my life. I can't eat chicken. I've got to fast and pray, all this stuff. Abraham knew that this was a test and a transitional point. And for God, he wanted to find out something about Abraham. I find this scripture very, you know, um, it, it, it tackles my theology because it tells me there are something God doesn't know until he tests us. He says, now I know that you what? Fear me. This year we spoke about what? Get wisdom. The fear of who? Of the Lord is the what? Beginning of what? Wisdom. So sometimes wisdom is not eloquence or speech. It's not aptitude of learning. It's obedience. Obedience. 
Sorry, it's a good word, guys, isn't it? Amen. <laughs> Sometimes wisdom is not, I have the answer for you, Iman, but I have the word of the Lord. Do this. This is so beautiful because through this transitional story, we get a new revelation of the name of God, Jehovah Jireh. There's something about your life, beloved, that's new, that's on the other side of your obedience in this thing called transition. There's something about your walk of faith that's going to become a picture, a story, a reminder, a word of confidence and encouragement that this is who God is. But it comes at a price. And that price is called sacrifice. But what I find funny about this thing called sacrifice, Isaac, is that what God was asking Abraham to give, he gave to Abraham. So I'm asking myself, is it really sacrifice or surrender? Is it really sacrifice if God is asking you to give back what he gave to you in the first place? Hmm. Is it really sacrifice, guys? Or is it surrender? Is it acknowledgement that my life is not my own? Is it actually worship, aka a response to God? When I put it like that, it puts into perspective that though God is asking for a hard thing, it's not really hard if I know and believe God is who he says he is. The same one who gave it to me can give it back to me. So Abraham's confidence is that, listen, I waited 25 years for this guy. God's asking me now to give him up. Well, the same God that I waited for is the same God that can raise him from the dead. So faith in God gives us a new logic, a new way of seeing things. We live by faith, not by sight. Faith takes away the natural senses that we have towards experiences and says, look, there's something at the source that's spiritual here that I can't see that God is in and somehow he can redeem. Are you following me here today? So outwardly, we're wasting, but somehow inwardly, we're being renewed. James chapter 1 gives us a story or a principle that says that we should not just be hearers only of the word, but doers. It says that him that does the word shall be blessed in all that he does. I want to echo this word because... I think last week I gave you guys some assignments, amen? I said, find out what God has said and what God is saying. And as I said before, it's important to have both references because what God has said is your foundation. What God is saying is your movement into what's happening next in your life, amen? And for us to be in alignment with God, which means to be in step and on time with God, we need to know both what God has said and what God is saying. And I love Abraham's response, here I am. It's the same response Samuel had, here I am. There's something about here I am. There's something about not just being here, but actually being present, guys. There's something about our ability to 
respond to God exactly when he calls us. And I want to encourage you. Sorry, this thing is making me feel interesting. <laughs> Someone's about to break in the room. Hallelujah. Um, amen. <laughs> There's power in the word. Okay. <laughs> I want us to be mindful that every response we give to God, that is what our worship actually is. It's not the slow song. It's not the offering. It's not like, we can't quantify it. If you guys follow me here, yeah? Our worship to God is our response. And today, I believe God wants a response from this house. Because the reality is like, we've been hearing, a lie. You know, I asked for the free teas, everyone was fumbling, hallelujah. <laughs> I charge it to worship. <laughs> we've been hearing, we've been hearing. God has been speaking. Have we been doing? And to stay in the do is to be present. Every day, Lord, here I am. Your servant is listening. When we talk about posture and worship, obviously we speak about, you know, your hands, your knees, your body. In the spirit, posture looks like what we say. In the spirit, posture is our confession. It's, it's, it's the direction of our gaze. It's posture is what is our first response when stuff happens. And when God gives us a picture of the throne and we see these angels and the four living creatures and whatnot, they have a, they have a posture, right? They bow, they cast their crowns, their face on the floor continuously because every time they see God there's a response to the glory of God and it's worship their posture shifts in this spirit beloved how is your posture and you can judge what your posture is by way of your confession your response I'm going to stop there I want to rise to our feet and um If, if I'm honest when it comes to this thing called transition and this thing called obedience, is that I'm a type of guy that needs adequate time before the face of the Lord to wean myself off my own will, if that makes sense. I'm a type of person that has to run the scenarios of what I would do and have next to me what God has said. And I'm the type of guy that prays every day, every day, guys. Lord, help me. Lord, give me wisdom. I'm saying all these things because I say it every week. I'm going to say it again. Prayer is telling God the truth. God works with truth, not with pretense. God responds to honesty, not what you think he wants to hear from you. That's religious. Relationship is being present, authentic with where you are right now. The beauty of this story of Abraham, once again, is that 2,000 years later, God didn't withdraw from giving away his only son for us. So the reality is, when it comes to obedience, there's nothing God is asking for you that he hasn't already done first. So maybe obedience is God's way of conforming you into his image and likeness. 
Maybe obedience is an invitation to the deeper things of God. Maybe obedience is what that intimacy that you're looking for looks like. Maybe obedience is what you're comparing and competing yourself to with your brother and sister. Maybe it's your obedience that will allow you to experience what you see them experiencing. Amen. So I want to encourage us, when we hear obedience, I don't want us to hear only what do I give up. I want there to be a joy that God's invited me to something more. I want us when we hear obedience that there's something about God that I haven't yet discovered, but on the other side of this disobedience, I'm going to discover something new about him. So even now, I just want you to be honest before the Lord. If you know what the Lord is asking of you and you have not yet done it, of course, repent, hallelujah. But get honest with God with why. He's not a taskmaster. He's not a frustrated daddy. He's very patient and kind, amen. God has not given up on you. Bible says that the Lord longs, he waits to be gracious to you. That's the heart towards the Father. He will be where the last thing he told you to do and will still be there to receive you. So on this Resurrection Sunday, I want you to come to him. Draw near to God. And I will draw near to you. And I want you to release whatever it is that you need to release that you know is stopping you from yielding and obeying God. Hmm. Hmm. You can even pray if you don't know, Lord, search me. Hmm. Know me, try me. Hmm. You can even confess your unbelief before God. And say, Lord, help me to believe. You can give God that struggle you have with forgiveness. Give God that offense. You can even give God where what he's asking for you doesn't make sense. You can give it to him. You can give it to him. Cast your cares upon him, for he cares for you. What burden are you carrying? The Lord wants to give you rest. What sins are you not confessing? The blood can still sanctify. Hmm. What pain, what loss are you experiencing? The Spirit of God can heal. Hmm. Whatever your need is, his name is I am. Hmm. Father, we just want to honor you on this Resurrection Sunday. Hmm. Father, I just lift up the minds of every individual in this house today. I prophesy, let there be light. Clarity peace and even understanding Lord I pray in this hour Father that your people will know and understand what your will is for them I come against every kind of aimless living Lord God I 
come against any form of spiritual barrenness where our lives are unproductive. I come against, Father Lord, even where the past has become a marker and a reminder of disappointment and discouragement, oh God. And today, I want us to be reminded by virtue of the resurrection of your son that you can turn things around, Father. That the enemy thought he won on Friday, but on Sunday, Jesus rose from the grave. The the enemy thought they had won on Friday, beloved, but on Sunday, Jesus rose from the grave. But I'm going to say it again. And whatever situation you're going through that looks like you lost, I'm here to tell you there's an appointed time for it to rise. The enemy thought he won on Friday. But on Sunday, Jesus rose from the grave. And the Bible calls this the hidden wisdom of God. He hid it from the enemy. Hmm that he might show himself strong. I pray in this hour of transition, the Lord will give you hidden wisdom, hidden manner, the type of wisdom that will confuse the enemies in your life. The type of wisdom that may look like loss in the world, but in the spirit it was gain. What eye has not seen and what air has not heard and nor has it entered into the heart of man that God has prepared for those who love him. But will the precious spirit of God reveal these things to you guys? In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.